welcome to this special edition of Storyboard Talks to Sir Martin Sorrell. Well, this is your quarterly edition of Martin Sorrell, except this time we're in Davos. Uh, with you. With me, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. For Does that mean the question is going to be tougher or is it going to be easier? I don't know. Easier. Easier, okay. Easier. You're trying to lull me into a sense of full security. Okay, tougher. <laughs> Uh, and now I'm going to begin with a very okay. easy question. Yeah. Is 2015 looking like a better year than 2014? In no, as a global business leader, uh, I would with say a business that spans many right, countries. Global, global business leader. So I, overall, it's a, it's a little bit better than our budgets are a little bit better than 2014. I'm not seeing the final figures for 2014, but if I look at our budgets for 2015, which we haven't quite finalised, but pretty much there, they look a little bit better. So three percent plus like for like growth uh, across the world or the world uh us doing well uh uk continuing to do well although there's uncertainty around uh, the election western continental europe france italy and spain still under pressure spain less so germany in reasonable shape eastern europe russia and ukraine obviously very difficult uh, if you go to america as i said us very strong i think it's a g2 year it's us and china really I'll come back to India in a second. Latin America, very uh, sort of um, a little bit better than last year, but the pattern in Mexico, we're still seeing, we're waiting for liftoff. Brazil, obviously, has been troubled uh, a little bit last year, uh, slowed down quite significantly. You've got issues around oil for Colombia, although it was doing well, and Peru sort of flattened out a bit. And then you've got Argentina and Venezuela with problems. Africa is generally <coughs> strong growth, but the problems in Nigeria, security corruption issues, Nigeria is the China of, uh, of Africa, make it difficult. Middle East, very varied. Uh, <coughs> and then if you go to Asia, Japan, still very difficult. Australia and New Zealand, difficult. The stuff in between, if I'm putting this India into the stuff in between, India is strong. India, we had a good year last year, and I'm looking at the budgets, it will be a very good year uh, this year. Uh, the Modi effect, pre-Modi, uh, Modi election effect, post election effect has been very good. So I'm very bullish. Of the four bricks, you know, India is the star at the moment. And uh, long may it continue. As you know, we've been an unashamed uh, uh, Indian bull, just like we've been an unashamed Chinese bull, too. Uh, and that goes for Russia as well uh, and Brazil. Uh, Russia is a bit dented at the moment. And hopefully, in time, that will get better. I think Brazil will. So we're still bricks. Mad, um, mad men and mad women, um, and mass men and mad, mass mad women men, I as well. But, uh, but, but, you know, in essence, this year, this year will be very similar to last year, a little bit better. Functionally, it's media and digital that drives drives the operations. So three percent was the growth you clocked in two thousand fourteen. Three percent plus, yeah. Three percent plus, and that's approximately what you'll do in two thousand. That was what the budgets were, and that's what what people are looking for, and the same for this year. Are you expecting... In you India, it'll be much stronger than that, actually. Stronger than 3%. Yeah. Uh, the sense I get here in Davos is there is a very high degree of uncertainty this year. as compared Geopolitical to uncertainty. Geopolitical well, yeah, people, people are worried about black swans. You know, they had the Ukraine. Here we were last year. Nobody really sort of thought about the Ukraine. I rise of ISIS. I mean, these are issues that people... You know, we didn't think we would have a terrorist in, in, in incident of the, of the, the, the Charlie Hebdo... A variety in Paris. We didn't think we would have anything in Sydney. We didn't think we'd have anything in Canada. Mm -hmm. So these are things that are, are worrying people. It's the black swans, what we call the black swans. Uh, and the gray swans you know about. I mean, the gray swans are the ones that we sort of think might happen. Mm -hmm. You know, now Ukraine is a gray, sw gray swan. Now uh, unrest in Hong Kong uh, surrounding China is a gray swan because we know about it. So it's it's the unknowns. It's the unknown unknowns as opposed to the known unknowns that, that people worry about. And I think people are right to be nervous because the world is a, a very difficult place. But it's it's not the you know, it's not the deficit, it's not low interest rates, it's not QE, it's not, you know, the Eurozone, it's not, you know, the, the British exit from the the potential exit from the, the Eurozone. I mean all of those will not help matters. But it's really, I think what scares people is, is, is those geopolitical events. In fact, at the IBC, the, of all the 12 things they said, you know, what are you worried about? The, the biggest thing was geopolitical events. I know advertising is a local uh, factor and those decisions are made locally. Well, but globally and locally, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if events of this nature, of this nature, as you have you you've just outlined, impact the way companies look at advertising spends. I'm trying to gauge. You said growth will be pretty much similar. I mean, little, little, little bit better. Actually, make that. Yeah, well, anything could make that worse this year. Well, you know, if you had a, a major geopolitical event, obviously, yes. I mean, I'm not, you know, sadly. So what, it, you know, if you're describing the world, low growth, certainly lower growth than we saw pre layman but that was understandable because it blew up under layman I mean, layman was too, pre-growth, pre layman growth was too strong for that reason. I mean, it couldn't carry on at that rate. So, so it had to lower. But if you look at it with inflation, four and a half, five percent, exit inflation is about three and a half percent. I just saw at the head of the World Bank, you know, they're, they're looking at, say, around three and a half percent with, with inflation, maybe four and a half, five. And that's not as fast as we would like as a whole for it to be, driven, as I said, by U.S. and to some extent China. China's slowed to 7.4. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's left. Some people say in reality it might be four and a half, five. I don't necessarily believe that's true. But even four and a half, five, the U.S. would kill for and the U.K. would kill for. And don't forget that China is a nine trillion dollar economy. U.S. is 16 and Great Britain is about two and a half, three. So so you've got to get this in. So it's the delta in China that's important. It's the it's the. Seven and a half point four percent on a base of nine trillion, and that's bigger than in the old days when it was two, three, four trillion, growing at ten nine and ten percent. So it's a delta that counts. So, so I, I think the world as a whole, it's slow growth. There's very little inflation. As a result, our clients have little pricing power. As a result, they put pressure on costs, and you see it in corporate results in the FMCG companies, for example, recently. Slower growth than anticipated in the top line, costs down, profits up. And currency and, volatility. Well, and currency volatility doesn't have. I'm talking about constant currency for a minute. I mean, we had a headwind last year. We're going to have a tailwind this year because uh, sterling has, has devalued quite sharply against, against the dollar, not, not against the euro. The euro is weakened even further. So euro reporting companies get a double whammy benefit. Uh, whereas, of course, they had had the problem when the, when when sterling or the euro was stronger against the dollar. But for us, you know, the the weak pound's gone from a 165 or whatever it touched to 150, 151 means a, 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 a sharp improvement, and that has overwhelmed the weakness of the euro uh, and its effect on our, imp our reporting. So I'm talking really about constant currency, excluding acquisitions, uh, like for like growth, and that's three plus. So, so it's not fantastic, but it's not a disaster. No, it isn't. But I think there was the expectation over the last few years that maybe by 2015 we'll have turned the corner from the global financial crisis. Well, well, there was. There was. And here we are in 2015 and we haven't. And, you know, if you talk, like Noru Rubini was talking at a dinner I was at, and, you know, he painted the sort of picture that I just painted. So I said, well, you know, what are we going to do about it? Because there was no answer. And I think, I think sadly, that we just have to, you know, inch our way through this. Um, you remember people were talking after Lehman about lost decades, yeah. right? Uh, you know, we're now, what, it's eight, call it, it's, it's nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We're, we're seven, seven years, let's call it, right? Another three years to go. I mean, my hope is that by the time we got to a referendum, if we do have a referendum on the, the EU, Western continental Europe would be in stronger shape and everybody in Britain says it's good to be part of the EU. You're watching elections closely in Britain? In, uh, yeah, and I worried about that because uh, I think it's more likely that Labour will manage to, to cobble together a coalition with the SNP than it is for the Conservatives. Now, the good news about that is we wouldn't have a referendum, although Peter Mandelson did say this morning at our breakfast with Reuters that it was possible that we would have one with a, with a Labour-controlled coalition. Uh, I don't think there'll be a majority party. If the Conservatives uh, run the coalition, then we'll have a referendum. The Prime Minister now says it could be earlier than 2017, which is great because it'll reduce the period of uncertainty, but there'll still be a period of uncertainty. Uh, I think if there was a referendum, I think people will vote in favour of staying in. It's a bit like the Scottish referendum. When you're faced, the Prime Minister had a good phrase, they call it the, the stillness of the ballot box or the quietness of the ballot box. You know, the head tends to overcome uh, the heart. And uh, so we'll see. Uh, but, you know, the, the case still has to be made in a much more effective way for staying in. Okay, I know I, you've spoken because, passionately because about that. Yeah, I know about passionately, but I, I think it's very practical. I mean, going out, I mean, Nigel Farage is, uh, is a, a rabble-rouser, but he's um, a very effective rabble-rouser. Alex Salmon is a very effective 
speak, I, you know, I, I've seen them both at first hand and uh, they're very, very powerful and very persuasive, very populist and with unemployment where it is and inequality being on top of everybody's mind, um, I think it's a difficult situation. Besides the fact that growth is uh, lackluster to, in 2015, what would you identify as some of your... Well, but it, let's just, we say lackluster, it's not terrible. It's not, it's, it, it's not as much as we would like, but maybe we have to adjust our expectations. Maybe, particularly in the West, not so much in India. I would expect six or seven percent at least, uh, so double the the world average. Um, it's 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 lacklustre. It's not, but it's not terminal or or you know really tough. I mean, the consequences of it I think are quite tough because of what I described the focus on cost. But it's no means a, by no means a disaster. I mean, there are worries. You know, the QE hasn't worked. We still have Europe in the doldrums, particularly Western Europe. Uh, so it hasn't worked as effectively as people have, but maybe it's going to take more time. That's my view. It's going to take more time to work its way out of the system. Maybe for strong long-term growth, you know, 5 6 7% worldwide growth is not a reality, and you have to, to adjust, particularly in the West, because I mean, the likelihood is... The BRICS and Next 11 will still be the strongest growth drivers. I mean, the World Bank, head of the World Bank said, you know, it's a very high, if it's three and a half, let's say, real, there's a big variation between the fast growth markets, which are four, four plus, and the mature markets, which are 2.2, led by the US, and with the US doing three plus. So, so it's a very sort of broad distribution, but the fast growth market is still growing faster. India will be the most populous country on the planet in 25 years' time. CNBC said that was going to be so. It must be so. I think it was Ernst & Young who did the, the auditing work on that. So it must be so, mustn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How do you navigate business in a year where you're faced by not so great growth, growing geopolitical tensions on the one hand, yeah. and then on the other hand, a big slump in crude oil prices, commodity well, prices coming down. That's yeah. the good news. So I'm I mean, contrasting the two and asking well, whether... That's the good news. Average income in America is $52,000. Uh, average disposable is 36 3000 a month. You know, falling oil prices uh, obviously has a big impact on disposable income, particularly in oil-rich countries. Uh, not, not oil exporters, but I mean the oil exporters like a Colombia, which has been growing, is going to be hurt by that sort of Venezuela, Argentina, already okay. in difficulty, going to be even worse. Malaysia hurt, Russia obviously hurt. You know, I think I remember the Russian finance minister said the Russian uh, economy works at eighty dollars a barrel. Well, here we are, you know, fifty or so, and, uh, and there clearly it doesn't work. So you've got the, the the two competing. I think on balance, cheaper oil prices give the economy a, a good plus. Having said that, um, if I said to you, BP acquired Amoco and Arco in 2001 2, what was the oil price? The oil price was $10 a barrel and $11 a barrel. So we forget that oil has been as low as that. Uh, so, where the oil price, and most of the people who I respect, uh, the head of one of the big oil companies, said to me earlier today he thought the oil price would be back at uh, sort of 60, 70. Uh, within a couple of years, if not higher, uh, because if you look at the basic demand and supply uh, relationships, we'll see. But all I'm saying is, in 2001-2, is at ten, eleven dollars a barrel. So you know, we've we've been in this this position before. Uh, yeah, I, I was just uh, sort of uh, trying to understand whether, in an environment like this, do you choose to grow, expand, or just well, you have to find the cash the, you have to find the growth spots. If the average is three plus, and there are markets like India growing at six plus. It means you want to do more in India. You, you know, you, I think uh, China, uh, you know, I would be a bullish on China in the longer run, maybe not just this year, but longer run. Russia will come back at some point in time on the assumption we find some agreement in relation to the Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Uh, and then Brazil will come back. So I still think the fundamentals are there, and I don't think you alter the strategy. Our strategy is still new, new markets, which are 31%. We want to be 40 to 45 New media, di digital, mm -hmm. is for 36. We want it to be 40 to 45. Data, 25% is roughly where it is. And horizontality, which means getting our 179,000 people in 111 countries to play together. So the strategy remains the same. I don't think you turn on a sixpence because of that. I think, you know, because the U.S. is so strong at the moment, you probably, I probably have a different view on the U.S. that I've become a little bit more U.S.-centric. Because I do think 2015 is a G2 world. I think U.S. and China are the two critical markets. 
not because of the China sl slowdown, but because of the delta that China gives you. Right. I mean, if it grows at seven and a half and it's 10 trillion, you know, that delta, and as somebody pointed out to me, one of our board members uh, pointed out to me, if you look at it on a per capita basis, per capita GDP delta might be very high because the population in China is not growing. I mean, they're, they're, they've got an aging problem where India has the reverse. It has the growth that will come from a youthful population. Okay, I want to talk about new media and data. Yeah. Uh, how do you see both of those uh, sort of evolve in 2015? What are some of the key trends that you're expecting? In more and more important and melding. So what I call our MIM business, which is Media Investment Management, and our DIM business, I was told not to call it DIM, but Data Investment okay. Management, I'm bringing MIM and DIM together in more coherent ways, I think is very important because I think both, it's clear to me that we get a spectacular advantage when we play off me media and data together. I've and I think so, so talent is obviously important, but technology you know, like at Nexus, uh, data like Kantar, uh, and content like Vice and Full Screen and Indigenous Media and the stuff we've done with Rat Pack and Time Warner in China with China Media Capital, what we've done with uh, all those content assets, Imagina, uh, are what we're doing with Bruin Sports in the sports area, sports content area, are all very important in terms of differentiation. So the answer to your question is data and media become even more important. The first party data, you know, our data business is $5 billion a year. And it's a very strong business in Italy, uh, sorry, in India, uh, as well as Italy. It's a very strong business in India and will continue to grow. And new media or digital is? Well, it's all part of it. What? I mean, what, what drives the media? Well, it should be 40 to 45%, it's 36% now. So, mm -hmm. about, so when will it get there? <clears throat> Well, uh, it grows. It's not so influenced by currency. The trouble with the, the fast growth market is that the currencies are weakened. So that 31% has not grown as fast as we wanted to because the RMB has been weak, the Brazilian real has been weak, the Indian rupee has been weak. I mean, it's, the, the Russian ruble has been terrible. So it's it's reduced the reduced the share. But digital, which is not which is applies to the strong currency markets as well as the weak ones, digital is not affected. So we get a 1% natural growth because they're growing faster and then 1% because of acquisition. So we would expect within three or four years to be in the, sorry, two to three years to be in the 40 to 45% range we want to be. And then, then I don't think that's enough. I think, you know, it should go to at least half of our business. What kind of acquisitions? Small and medium sized. I mean, we did a lot last year, a hell of a lot. We exceeded our acquisition limit, which was 300 to 400 million pounds. Yeah, and we, we but actually, Ibope, we, we took control of the audience measurement business in Latin America. Uh, that, that, that transaction is not closed yet because it's subject, subject to regulatory approval. But, uh, you know, we, we were very aggressive in terms of acquisitions. In terms of the number of acquisitions, we probably, you know, we, for the last two to three years, we've been up there with Intel and Google. So this is a question more on the nature of broadcast and how it's changing. Uh, I was talking to an India media leader, yeah. and he said that he thought that the next big broadcast corporations of the future were Netflix or Amazon. Or, and yeah, well, Am Amazon certainly, and they've had some content successes already. Netflix have had content, you know, uh, full screen. Uh, and Media Rights Capital, Media Rights Capital produced House of Cards, which is, was a success on Netflix. The question is whether that model works from a profitability point of view, whether spending all those that money on content you know, when you look at the P&L, you know, how long can that, will it generate sufficient revenues to pay for the content? And that's not, the jury is still out on that. Uh, what we have seen in America is, you know, we know that on print, traditional print, felling trees, distributing newsprint, consumers spend 5% of their time, we still invest 19%, not we, but the industry does, in media budgets. Mm -hmm. We know internet and mobile, they spend 45% of their time on that, and we know that the industry invests only 23 24%, so that hasn't changed. What's happened on, 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 on linear TV is quite interesting. For the first time, we've seen this discrepancy. 38% time spent, 45% investment. So there's something happening, and I'm not too clever enough to figure it out. There's something happening to TV viewing, and we see this with the Twitter data that we get, yes. that Kantar gets, that shows consumer engagement with uh, live programming. And, you know, the measurement devices have to be changed. Uh, because the new technologies, uh, you know, CNBC in America, you know, fired Nielsen. And they, what they did was they, they have this panel cogent, which is an out of home, because you know, CEOs who watch CNBC Squawk Box, for example, don't have set-top boxes in their home.
Nine. We're having the same trouble with audience measurement in India. I know. Right? Uh, something yeah. close, VR close VR. to our, close to our, our hearts and and home. Yeah. Uh, we know we're making changes. So I'm, I'm curious. Five years from now, if you had to look down and tell me what advertising will look like, what broadcast will look like, what are one, the couple of things that you'd bet on? Well, I, I think you know clearly it's a continuation of these trends. I mean, I would bet on obviously mobility. And if I look at China as a bellwether of this, if I look at the there's two things: mobility and e-commerce. So, if you look at the two success stories, Alibaba, sixth most valuable company on the planet, mm. Xiaomi fourth round, third round of venture capital, in fourth year, Asia, and 45 billion valuation. You know, and you've got mirror images of this in India. Yeah. You've got models now that have been doing it, and the fact has become very sexy. Uh, Son San, you know, with Nikesh Aurora are roaring around, and the, there are others too. The, yeah. the Indian yeah. oligarchs are, are all over it too. So all, all this means, I think, that e-commerce, obviously affecting retailing, big box, less important. Proximity retailing and e-commerce, more important and mobility. Our relationship with Google is our biggest media relationship. It's three billion out of the $75 billion book, at least last year. That three billion, the bulk of the growth has come from two areas, mobile search and video, particularly in high penetration TV markets like India, where we've grown our business with Google exponentially, and in Brazil, and in Italy. So even economies that are flat, like Italy, you know, we see big growth in those search and video functions. I was reading a New York Times article that indicated that there is a generation of Amer Americans growing up now that have never owned a TV set. Well, it's not, not, not it, there is a, the generation that's graduating from university have probably lived with the internet not for all of their life, but for most of their life. Yeah. Just think when, you know, every, that person graduating has lived with the internet ever since they popped their head out of the womb. That means, I think, a very different attitude. I mean, this is very motherhood and apple pie, I think. But when those people get into positions of influence, you know, I met uh, Evan Spiegel, who, run, who, who owns Snapchat. You know, he's a billionaire at the age of 25, at, on, on paper at least. And, you know, obviously his attitude is very different mm -hmm. to, uh, although he had some very interesting points to make about traditional content and traditional content approaches and about advertising, but uh, which, which surprised me and interested me. But having said that, you know, these are the people that will be in power and have command of these resources in the future. Will TV be dead in five years? No, no, it'll be in different forms. And you know, the TV as we know it will be dead. No, no, you'll, you'll, that will continue. It's not like newspapers. I mean, you can't say you know people say newspapers die. They're never going to die. There will always be some, but it's going to get more and more difficult. It will be more difficult for newspapers and magazines than it will be for traditional TV. Traditional TV will always have a very strong position. You know, some people say the data that I gave you, the Mary Meeker data, as I call it, is bogus. So that you shouldn't look at time spent. You should look at impressions. I think that's wrong. I think there is something going on. But it's not as violent. And the traditional networks will adapt their model over the top, in, as it's called, uh, digital, in ways that will accommodate those changes. But, you know, you know if you're saying Netflix lives and... You know, Star TV's dead. For, think again. You know, no, Uday is far too clever to f not to figure that one out, and it's been very aggressive, as you know, in recently, uh, in doing that. I mean, it's made some very recent moves in the last few weeks, which which I think are very creative and very strong, uh, and will be very successful. Okay, final question then. Your yeah. India outlook. Uh, I'm bullish. I'm, I'm a raging bull. <laughs> <laughs> raging bull. My favorite film, Raging okay, Bull. Great. All right. uh, we'll leave it there. Thank, thank you, you so much, much for your time, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Malik. Thank you for Thank speaking you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.